culture gone bad is back after a break. After a long time. After a long time. And September seems to be a mild month, but it's also been rather um, eventful. Jupi, what were you doing on the day the Queen passed away? So the day the Queen passed away, which for me, as our listeners will know by now, was a shock because I am a strong believer in the monarchy and in the Queen. Uh, unlike, not in, unlike myself. Unlike you, exactly. Uh, I was uh, in, at my parents' house in Sardinia. I was in the pool. And I hope you didn't flip on your inflatable. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Maybe your it was a very, it was a very short pool. Uh, and I went to out of the pool. Uh, I looked at my at the news in my phone, and and they said the queen is in, is in uh, under scrutiny by the medical team. And in that moment, I understood what happened. Then a friend of mine texted me and said, the Queen is leaving us. And then I watched the BBC straight away, I think it was the BBC, and some, some TV show. And I noticed that this, the, the journalists were all dressed in black. And at that point, I understood, I knew that she already died, but they didn't, you know, release the news. And they, and they I think they said it mm. in, in, at, se- at six, seven o'clock. What were you doing? I was at an art exhibition, obviously. Obviously. Surprise, surprise. Uh, yeah, I was uh, seeing latest Carol Schumann exhibition at Barbican. She's like an activist, feminist artist from 60s and 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So very, very... Carol Lee. Yeah, Carol Lee. Yeah. 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 Uh, very strong sort of feminist vibes. Yes. Yeah. It's probably a suitable thematic you know strong woman is she is she's the one who made that famous picture with the vagina out and the and the rifle well vagina was in the paper was out of vagina <laughs> <laughs> yeah. she wrote like a feminist manifesto and when she put yeah. it inside of her vagina and when she took it out and read it in front of everyone uh, no i think i'm talking about another thing is uh, the one that in which is a famous um uh, performance in which she is dressed but her vagina is out and she's got a rifle in her hands and the same thing has been replicated by Marina Abramovich in, in one of her performances in which she reenacted uh, some famous um, feminists, uh, not only feminists, some famous, um, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. It's, if it's, it would it's have, she. It's she. Yeah. It's her. Uh, yeah, she, she does like a lot of emphasis on vagina. Yeah. You know what? A uh, very interesting actual exhibition, well curated, but she's definitely a perfect example of your generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and totally. so was the queen. So was the queen of many generations. Yeah, but, you know, I'm not uh, into supporting monarchy and I'm not a fan of a uh, royal family. I appreciate their symbolic value. I appreciate their power to unite our society. But I have many... Um, complex uh, relationships towards you know how the taxpayer money are being used and all the wealth they acquired and what we symbolize historically for me you know but at, at the same time what I, do you symbolize historically oh well, you know what any story of power dynamics of monarchy or aristocracy for me is uh, associated with a symbol of conquest death and uh Aggression, really, because but, hold on a minute. But this doesn't have anything to do with monarchies. Because take the United States. Not only they have a, a legacy of imperialism that that is much more recent, so much less excusable than than the British monarchy. But also on top of that, they tend to replicate monarchies by having dynasties of politicians like the Clintons or the Bushes or now the the Obamas will probably because everybody's talking about Michelle running for president so that's also a, a re a sort of enactment of a an aristocracy without having the symbolic value of the British aristocracy so I don't think the salvation from what you are saying the response is necessarily democracy if you replicate the same so that's just human 
Does it, does it make sense what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, it does. I it doesn't. I mean, I, I think the symbol of the monarchy, precisely because it's it's established by history, it's controlled. Whereas when in in republics in which the, the, that tradition of you know aristocracy etc. is not controlled by tradition, therefore is free from co the constraints of society, it's much more in a way paradoxical to me. I mean, you know what I find politics disgusting as well. Like, look, I I don't uh, find any of our politicians aspirational. And I find, you know, them, for me, uh, everyone I see in power were way on the a spectrum from being completely disgusting and horrendous towards being ridiculous. Like, I, I don't find any of them, uh, you know, to be people in whom I trust or who I think... You know, in, in fact, I think you're right on this. I don't trust the people. I trust, trust no one. I, I trust the symbol. I don't trust the individuals. Prince Andrew is indefendable. You know, you can't excuse Prince Andrew. There's no way. But the symbol is a different story. That's what yeah. I defend. Look, I think going back to royal family... My point is Queen is probably the last person among all these people, probably because of her upbringing, her generation, some consequence of events. She had a decent persona, identity, and mm -hmm. to be honest, she managed to hit who she yeah. really was really Exactly, by. and that's, that's exactly what I appreciated about her. Everyone else seems to be just bizarre, miserable person, not being able to hold himself together even for official ceremony. Mm. Do you think so? I yeah. think Princess Anne has been out amazing, outstanding. She she really she really embodied what I appreciate about the monarchy. I think King Charles is very early days. He's not, but I think he has changed his attitude uh, already since when he was a prince. So when since he was, the pen leaked, <laughs> yeah, I mean that that is a that, it was it's I mean that was a very stressful situation. I understand what I mean is when he was a prince was very political, very outspoken. Now is much less so. Is much more tame, meaning that and this is the belief in systems. Okay, in in structures to be, you know, the idea of structuralists is not your individuality that matters. Is the structure when you become a king, you're occupying an empty space in the structure, which will mold you. You don't own the title. The title owns you. Therefore, you change according to that. And I have great hope in William and, William and Kate, as much as I have great despair for, for uh, Harry and Meghan. Yes, uh -huh. but William and Kate have got great hope. Now, there is a lot of hate about, about uh, especially Kate Middleton, which is commonly referred to as Kate Middleclass <laughs> by some of my acquaintances who are very snobbish, um, and probably now they're listening to this. Uh, but uh, I think she is the perfect example of, of what the Queen has been. That's why I've, gre I've got great hope. We don't know what she thinks about anything. She, the moment she became princess, she disappeared as an individual, and she became a working royal. And that's what I appreciate in, in this new generation. So I've got hope. I don't know, Drippy, maybe yeah, somehow way the United Nations like I appreciate the value we bring but for me we just increase the difference between our society and I think for me personally in the moment where UK economy is in collapse we have crisis we have lack of sort of a uh, people who know what we're doing. At least it seems to me what people make decisions. Next day we turn around and say, sorry, didn't think about mm -hmm. it through. And we have this grandiose funeral for 10 days when most of people having all this but crisis. Alexa I don't know. I, Alexander, yeah. this, this is this calculation. First of all, that is... Once again, it's very important. It keeps the country together and it has united the country and it has united the Commonwealth a lot. So there is already a political reason that justifies the 10 days of mourning. Uh, but there is another thing. You are 
taking out from this consideration one very important element. The fact that Britain has a royal family is a source of income for Britain. There is a huge amount of money that is moved by the monarchy because, it, because mainly because of tourism. Uh, even uh, during the uh, state funeral, London was full. Full. Like the hotels, everything was full because a lot of people came that moved the economy a lot. So I don't really agree on the fact that they we are paying for them. Yes, we are paying for them with our taxes, for some of them, not for all of them, with our taxes. It is also true, though, that they bring some money into, I think several percentages of the GDP are due to the presence of the royal family in Britain. No, that's fine. And, you know, we probably have to compare statistics. There's one funeral in a few decades uh, makes up for the amount of money we're getting. Probably does, probably doesn't. I think we have to look at the actual numbers to make this, you know, financial yeah, conclusion. Yeah, of course. But uh, again, Jeppe, like, I get it. They bring money. People love them. They unite nation. They have this a wider idea for society. But I find uh, what it brings us closer to Asian Egypt rather than to progressive modernity. Well, and that's my, my point uh, is, taste for that. My point is that we do not have any certainty. First of all, it's not like ancient Egypt because the king in England uh, and the queen, the monarchy in England had the amazing uh, intuition of transforming the monarchy into a constitutional monarchy, starting a new tradition of democracy in the West. So first of all, that doesn't, that distances it from, you know. The point that I'm trying to make is there is absolutely no demonstration, none so ever, that countries without a monarchy who remove the monarchy. I'm not for reinstating the monarchy where it doesn't exist, by the way. Okay, republics should stick to the republican heritage. What I'm saying is removing the monarchy does not grant a better situation. Think about what happened to Russia after the Tsar was, you know, sent, uh, was, was, was killed. You had um, they had uh, Soviet Union and now Putin. It didn't really necessarily improve. It's not China, same thing. It's not necessarily a progression. In Europe, the countries with the monarchy are the countries with more stable economies and the countries with more civil rights. But Jeppe, where is our stable economy in the UK today? I, I didn't say that those countries are the heavens. I said more stable than countries with no stable with with no monarchy. I'm comparing the the UK and Sweden with with Greece, Italy. Th that's what I'm saying in terms of civil rights as well. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that there is absolutely no empirical demonstration that the monarchy is a is 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 something that is against progress and it's worse than than republic there's no demonstration if you empirically can, can demonstrate can demonstrate that i respect your opinion in terms of your your philosophical view and i've got no absolutely i i truly respect that but if we talk about data i don't have i don't see how empirically uh this can be justified. Oh, Drupa, I'm not looking to justify anything. Like for me, it's not about empirical evidence. I, I'm just saying what, uh, for me, that just symbolizes what people need something to unite around. And monarchy is one of its institutions. Religion is another, yeah. national idea is another. Yeah. Um, I find any idea of authority to be problematic as well, but when we need something to structure our society. But do I think monarchy is the supreme way to unite society? I don't think so, but I understand their value. Mm. Also, think about Scotland. They do want some half of the Scottish population. It's always half. So that's another problem in Scotland with in terms of independence. They do want to become independent, but they do want to keep the monarchy. Did you know that? So the, their idea, they don't want to get rid of the monarchy. They never wanted to get rid of the monarchy. And, and, you, and we had a demonstration during the funeral. What they want is they want to be an independent country still under the British monarchy. 
to make sense like yeah. like a commonwealth Drip, nation i get it i okay i will paraphrase my point i think all human beings need to be able to have the same level of conversation be approachable and equal on terms of interrelationships and i find it's ridiculous what there is some sort of a incredibly a polite approach to royal family you in order to talk to them you have to develop specific manners whereas regulations where etiquette and how you treat royal family i think we should treat all people equally and i find the etiquette moment, you've got in republics as well you cannot speak to the president exactly exactly and that's why i don't like politicians well okay. I, i don't like the idea what we have people in a society whom we somehow put above and we need to treat them differently i believe you, in having a society if it really wants to contribute to well-being of everyone we have to treat everyone equally and i think monarchy doesn't bring this possibility it strategizes it doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't i don't think though i i agree with you monarchy doesn't politicians don't Uh, I think the only point in which we diverge here is we both agree on this is that I don't think that you can ever achieve what you're saying because countries require that require don't rituals mind that have time I to think, achieve I think that. countries require rituals otherwise there would be a communist which I'm not uh the, you know preaching equality because even even who preached equality in history was the main agent of inequalities eventually because it's simply impossible to achieve it just doesn't doesn't yeah, but no, I, I I'm, I'm not, not trying that, to change your yeah. mind anyway I respect uh, I respect your opinion and I love that sometimes we disagree on things yeah look I mean I just think it just transports into our relationships you know uh from my experience when i you know with corporate career when you have corporations which are very regulated on how you deal with leader with top management and when assistance yeah. it becomes very disgusting at some point but in a business is where everyone is treated more or less equally it brings a very different dynamic and you suddenly have this i don't know uh shipishness like you know when you actually scared mm-hmm. to approach in when in higher management you're afraid of admitting mistake or being honest about what is realistic and what is not and i think if we have this embedded fear of authority or some sort of a superior respect towards them it often brings in corruption lies and h- hidden hiding the actual facts because people when they have a feeling of authority they often are afraid to admit the reality of situation and i think the perfect example we have in russia right now which is very extreme but what it seems to be no one has you know ability but you to see- Yeah, the, the Russia for me is a good example. That's a uh, that's an example of what uh is not a, an example that translates to monarchy. That's an extreme example of uh, of uh, Isn't putting a the... contemporary tsar. Uh, yes, exactly, but he's not a contemporary uh, um, uh western mm-hmm. type of monarchy. That's exactly yeah. my point. Western monarchies and I'm talking speci- specifically about the British monarchy have the ability of not being a tsar. of doing constitutional monarchy and when you have that sort of respect for the king is not for the person that you have that respect it's for the institution in putin's case there is no it's always him is not what is not the space he's occupying within the symbolic system is the person and i don't think uh, the people i i agree with you people should be equal symbols are not equal The moment you should sit on a throne you are different not because you are intrinsically different but because the space you're occupying within the symbolic system is different there is a phrase that i always quote that comes from Jacques Lacan who used to say that a poor man who thinks he is a king is a crazy man is a crazy person but a king who thinks he is a king is also equally crazy because you should never conflate the space you occupy within the symbolic system with who you really are as an individual so if we're talking about individuals i agree with you equality symbols different story yeah you know what it's very interesting because i recently just came back from italy i went to see venice biennale mm. which is back after three years break which is quite an event Um, you know what was very interesting so they picked 
Leonora Carrington uh, yeah. idea of milk of, of a dreams. Yeah. And that was basically a reflection on our society of humans, interaction with unanimated objects, identity, and sort of uh, our planet without humans. And a lot of comments of people who went to see Biennale was that there was no clear message and it was very confusing and it was very difficult mm-hmm. to put the idea together. Somehow I didn't feel that. I felt it was incredibly straightforward. And some pavilions or some parts were different. I think that was exactly the symbolism of our society going in so many different directions today. And everyone is searching for their identity and uh, the gender fluidity in which our society is going through. I think this whole Biennale was a perfect example of how all issues which are present in our society discourse today are actually embodied in art practice. Because our society is very separated, we are very polarized, and we don't have anyone sticking to anything. Everyone is like a constant, you know, uh, fluid state of yeah. being and identity. And yeah. that was exactly it for me. But I think we have a lot of very strong art pieces and pavilions, which were incredibly great and I think what we did really well, it's not only sticking to the main exhibition areas, we have uh, a lot of little isolated um, sort of uh, small exhibitions, which were also great. It is interesting what you were saying about Carly Schneemann being a very corporeal, physical, um, feminist artist and putting the the vagina of these artists occupy center stage traditionally Mm -hmm. in the 20th century women have been extremely physical probably much more than men have been men have always been more intellectual than physical uh, in 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 terms of women using the body a lot um uh, especially feminist 20 late 20th century uh, performance artists now think about the fact that those women, Karolich Neiman, for instance, putting their body and their vagina as a, uh, in, in linguistic terms, we can say metonymy, uh, a synecdoche of their mm-hmm. body, the part that speaks for the whole. You wouldn't be able to do that today, even embracing the same values, because vagina does not mean woman anymore in our society. So uh, what yesterday seems so progressive, today seems so regressive. And what today seems so progressive probably will be regressive tomorrow. And that's the reason why I always I, I always think that artists should find a meaning that goes beyond the here and now, because the here and now dies. Yeah, that's uh, very and it interesting. It needs to, mo- to modify itself in time, to, to open to the possibility of, of being reinterpreted. You know what? I think what you bring about men and women. So every time I think about prominent women artists of 20th century who, like you said, focused on body practice, they all are quite attractive and they have erotic flair towards them. Marina Abramovich, Karol Schumann, you, you know, Rebecca you, Horn. Yeah, she's oh, beautiful. Vanessa Baker, maybe she's Vanessa, a bit more. Yeah. But we are super sexy. Like, we are yeah. very attractive. Yeah. And I think we are also very attractive almost on a Western guest. But even if you think about Yoko Ono, she, you know, she's the one who, you know, ruined Beatles yeah. at all. Uh, but uh, I think this woman somehow saying that they are discriminated in the society took a huge advantage of their. Uh, yeah, uh, physical appearance. Yeah. But when I think about artists who practiced this intellectual side, like you say, man, and for me, that was actually the big favorite aspect of being Ali, being, you know, sticking true to what I'm comfortable with. Of course, I liked Naguchi installation. Of course, I liked Rufa Sawa. And Rufa Sawa, who is this American Japanese artist who created this organic structure? Oh, yeah, yeah. The uh, one with the eyes. wires yeah. and shot, like wire. Like, okay, actually, yeah, I'll show you. I have like a little booklet so you will recognize who I made it. But she did this sort of um, installation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. She had an exhibition at uh, Modern Art Oxford recently, which is beautiful. But she also was represented at Biennale. And I watched some videos with her. She has zero sex in the same hills. <laughs> but I think that's why her art is not about her. It's about 
a reflection yeah. in our society, yeah. Yeah. our relationship yeah. of nature and our environment. And what for me, what was 20th century modernist start about, you know, starting with Brancusi and then goes yeah. on and on. It's a negotiation of our experience of this life. And that's why I think Maria Bartruzova exhibition at Tate Modern, which recently opened, and it she also represented the Biennale, talks about this organic shapes and sort of negotiating body shape, shape of uh, nature and environment together. I think if this is timeless dialogue, we will always think about yeah, our exactly. place in yeah. the world and environment. I think you hit a chord there because um, the perfect example of this is the, is the French artist Orlan. Mm. Uh, because uh, she started out as a feminist. She's probably still identifies as a feminist. But what is interesting to me is how, uh, as you say, initially it was very corporeal. It was very bodily. And, and the body was a vehicle to convey a an artistic message, like in all the artists that you quoted. And then at some point during the late 20th century and the 21st century, the body has become disembodied you know, with postmodernity, everything melts into thin air and the body has become disembodied and, and the body has become a concept rather than a mm -hmm. real thing. And Orlan shows this very well. She started out as a feminist. She used to, in one of her performances, she sells kisses. She, mm -hmm. she They pay her for a kiss uh, with tongue and everything, or they measures a square using her own body as a measuring tape uh, and does all these very corporeal things. And then at some point in the 90s, she undergoes a series of plastic surgery that turn her beauty into something monstrous. Today, she is mon monstrous, but that's exactly what she wanted to be. And the body has become disembodied and became something that doesn't look human anymore with cheekbones instead of uh, on, on her forehead. So uh, displaced body parts, uh, precisely what you're saying. The body started out as a sexiness, as you know, and then it became something abstract. Even. Yeah, there was a lot of exploration of this theme. But, you know, it's it's a very contemporary dialogue, but you are very, you are very right. I do wonder in a long run, which of these artists and practices will stay with us because yeah. a lot of them, we are incredibly focused on contemporary moment rather than yeah. eternal dialogue between ourselves you know, and our existence. One who will remain, and I've got no doubt about this, is Barbara Kruger. Mm. And the reason why Barbara Kruger will remain is because you can never say what she really means with her artworks. Mm. Even people say that her work, uh, Your Body is a Battlefield, is, you know, a, mm -hmm. an artwork about, about a, against, uh, the, for abortion, advocating for freedom of women, etc. Yes, but that's one interpretation. But I can twist her work to make it mean something else as well. Uh, you cannot cage her into one single concept. It's an open work. And that's what will grant her. And, and this is typical of Barbara Kruger. She's very cynical in her phrases. Sometimes she looks, sounds superficial. And then, in fact, she's very deep in all these slogans she puts there. There is an openness that is what will make her eternal tomorrow. She is incredibly smart. And uh, that was quite a powerful installation uh, with typical Barbara Kruger when ceiling, walls and floor are covered in her writings. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm a big fan of Barbara Kruger, yeah, Kruger hands same. down. Uh, she also is very good at writing. Like I have some of her books, very difficult to buy, by the way. It's, we don't really sell them that commonly, but uh, very intellectual, very smart. And she is probably the perfect example of looking at sort of low culture and then questioning it, which yeah. is, you know, yeah. endless, endless practice, both in all aspects of our culture. Uh, but I think, you know, I'm quite interested also where are many digital artists as well who sort of using this aesthetics of video games and digital yeah. post-human negotiation, which of course started with sci-fi. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also very fascinating to see how artists manage to take uh, something which seems to be very leisure activity based, like video games, but when in the narrative of all this very stimulating, overly stimulating visuals, the narrative which we tell is very disturbing. We like question our loneliness, our isolation in the society, what we believe to be yeah. truth. I think 
actually it's very interesting like digital art which is just engaging your senses is one thing but using this digital art as a to mean something yes yeah, yeah, it's yeah. almost like barbara kruger but yeah. with a it's, it's a bit day. also like jenny holzer yeah like that, that is to me that's masterpiece when yeah. she when she put on Times square uh protect me from what i want mm -hmm. do you remember yeah that is such a simple and yet uh open message that could mean two things at once that are opposite you know is she what is she really saying what where did she really put it there in the temple of desire in times square at christmas so you know that's the sort of things i think that will remain uh because for the reasons we were saying because 100 they open, yeah. agree you know i'm also very skeptical about ai art of course there was some but you know it's like the art which is created by yeah. computer yeah Like, I understand there are a lot of technical possibilities, but I think when it lacks a human analysis or human intellectual contribution, it's almost like, I don't know, sensorial experience, nothing more to it. Yeah, I don't think that in art, McLuhan was right. You know, the medium is the message. Mm. I don't think that applies to art. In art, is never the medium that is the message, it's always the concept that is the message. And you, but if you change medium, it doesn't really matter unless there is a strong concept behind. But you know what? I think it's also sort of our own bias. I think we are very analytical. We look for meaning. We reflect on things. And when you do that, you probably resonate with art, which sort of has this message, which is more, uh, you know, sort of transferable with time. But I think potentially in a contemporary culture, things which are bold and fascinating and resonate with today they probably yeah they have an echo people. they have an echo yeah and they are entertaining but that's not what art traditionally is and i'm quoting arthur danto yeah. that's danto's idea that art is always about its concept never about its medium um otherwise duchamp wouldn't exist because you know the ready made yeah. is not is not a an interesting medium in itself is the concept that, that that you read through it that is that is fundamental you, you know, know that, that's the know. one thing that has never changed in in western art since you know since the middle ages and probably even before since byzantine art is the fact that the medium has always changed but it has always carried a very specific concept you know for me somehow also art which has very powerful quality is transgressive messages messages or experiences in art which make us uncomfortable challenge our yeah. biases yeah. and make us think about things we'd rather not. That has a very yeah. powerful ability. Yeah, you see, that, that's interesting because uh, I, I, with the, this is something that sociologists of art have written about extensively. In the 20th century, after Dadaism uh, and the early avant-garde, which died out very soon, by the way, um, after those... Uh, avant -garde, the um, art has always been measured against the amount of scandal it created. You know, the more scandalous it is, the more artist, the more mm -hmm. valuable it is, right? Uh, it has always been so in art in the 20th century. Uh, the problem is that we reach a point today in which the rebellion is empty, it's barren. It, 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 you want to rebel for the sake of rebelling. And since everything is rebellion, nothing seems rebellious. So today, the only rebellion is going back to being conservative, uh, is going back to being traditional, is going back to, is exiting the circle of transgression. That's the only transgression you can do today. Now, think about the, what you were saying about gender fluidity, et cetera. Is that a transgressive message? That is exactly I don't the ethos think it of, is. Exactly. That's exactly the ethos of our society. You can find that message in any Instagram account, in any, uh, in any trashy influencer is going to be advocating for that. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's not is not transgressive, is not as transgressive as people would love to sell. Uh, no, you know what? So today transgression yeah. is a tradition. I think I also mean transgression, which is not so obvious. I think it's a sort of a veneer transgression. For example, Paola Raga, she also yeah. was presented at the Biennale. Her paintings are quite disturbing. Yeah. 
but Very. they're also mesmerizing. And I think this is a totally. transgressive quality because it Absolutely. makes you question the dynamics, who is in charge, and what is actually the story being presented so towards you. I think Paolo Rego was born in a different era in which okay. transgress transgression was still possible. At the time, it was much easier to transgress because society was so closed and narrow-minded that it she could work with those codes. She could twist those codes. Like in Paula, what I like about Paula Rego is that there is always a second reading of the situation. You see a family and then you approach the painting, you look at the family carefully and you notice that there is some violence going on and you didn't notice mm -hmm. it straight away, you know, and she's questioning the idea of the family. But now the concept of a family has been so destroyed in our society that a painting like that wouldn't probably make the same sense. So it is, it is, every artwork is obviously also context dependent to some degree. Uh, and, and she lived in a world that allowed transgression because the rules were much more stern. So what I'm saying is, you are so right that I think Today, we are creating new, um, new faux pas, new, uh, how can I say, new rules in our society, uh, which are the rules of all the rules that seem progressive until yesterday, today are becoming oppressive. And those rules will create the possibility of future transgressions. So what until today has been progressive, inclusivity, diversity, all those amazing things, uh, are today treated as a religion, not as progressive messages anymore. And because they are religion, they impose new rules. And this opens the possibility for artists twisting them on their head and, and being somehow transgressing them. That's the future yeah. possibility. Um quite fascinated what the future holds. By the way, we also sort of wrapping up the fashion month and fashion weeks. Obviously, it was a big uh, fall, like sort of flop in London with Queen passing away. Yeah. Uh, a lot of shows were cancelled, they were scheduled. Or they used the funeral as a marketing message, like Richard Queen. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know, Drippy. You know, I have to say, I obviously, being a fashion practitioner, I. <laughs> I kind of was looking on what I want to invest in. And somehow Italy really struck me this year. Uh, maybe because I just came back from Italy. Maybe I've been which, which, uh, which shows? Uh, Valentina and Fendi are really, really getting close to my bank account. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> that's very... <laughs> It's very iconic. They're very, getting very close to my bank account, <laughs> if only. Uh, <laughs> so I think that uh, the, the, there is one uh, one thing that characterizes these fashion weeks, all in Italy as well as Paris, so Milan as well as Paris, uh, is the fact that a lot of relevant brands opted for DAO, even almost boring collections uh, made of simple basics. I think yeah. Prada, Miu Miu, even 90s Valentino. Minimalism, it, exactly, yeah. even Valentino. And I think certainly in our world that is obsessed with uh, with um, excess and and spectacle, uh, they come across as uh, as dull and boring. But in fact, I think that's a great intuition of Prada. Every now and then, I'll create a boring collection because it's a palate cleanser. So it's a it it somehow washes your mouth from all the excess and prepares for the next season of excess. So I think this was very, and, and even those collections that are supposedly boring are in, were in fact very interesting to me, so I agree with you. They were quietly fascinating. And that's the reason probably why we, uh, we thought that Coperni was such a... <laughs> I don't know. To be honest, I've seen this technique maybe 15 years ago. So it's not innovative. Yeah. And but um, you know, can we tell our listeners what happened? Can you tell them? Yes, basically we had was it Bala Hadid? Yeah, yeah. Bala Hadid naked and went to men 
sprayed the dress in her and she literally was naked. I think she was wearing some yeah, underwear. Yeah, yeah. And when we literally they sprayed, sprayed some latex, probably. I think it's some cellulose fiber oh, cellulose. out of spray can. And when it turned into a dress, and when I think in the end of the day, you can probably, I don't know, wash it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, what nothing new but you know and also if you think about alexander mcqueen that was the real performance not this you mean the 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 2000 yeah, yeah, performance yeah, yeah, where yeah. he sprayed the model yeah, yeah. but that was at least trans also you know what the, exactly but also you know the difference uh that is one of the uh shows that i always show my students i always dedicate one day in which i discuss mcqueen and i show exactly that amongst others show to them but Everybody remembers that show for the final performance with the models being sprayed mm -hmm. by two uh, machines that uh, traditionally spray cars. Mm -hmm. So there was this beautiful uh, sort of message, which is that every dress is only completed on the stage when it's shown on a catwalk. That was, mm -hmm. I think, the, 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 you know, the, the underlying concept. What people forget is what came before that part of the show. Now, that was so interesting because everything that came before was amazing, amazingly constructed. You know, McQueen was a real, real designer with outstanding skills, but nobody remembers those. Everybody remembers the only one thing that probably was never put on sale, <laughs> was never sold as in stores, which is the final dress. And that's my problem with Coperni. Uh, it, that uh final thing was interesting but the previous dresses bit boring so you didn't show me anything specific to get to the point so my point is we are putting so much effort so much performance focus on the performance and we are not putting focus uh, giving focus to what really would deserve focus which is the clothes that people are gonna wear in the street next season yeah for me yeah of course performance even the same with balenciaga right oh it's my gosh get, yeah. getting from mart get, yeah, getting yeah, yeah. from mart. But also i was trying to see the pictures on vogue runway and i couldn't because I it like was how too, all too models dark. had their mouth open i think we were like brief to have i mean anyway bizarre bizarre but uh, my favorite bit about Copernic dress, I found, uh, I think it was in a design where there's an opportunity for people to comment and where I will hate comments. Like no one, no one liked it. Everyone was like, this is cheap trash. And what do you expect me to carry a can around with me? I didn't see those. And then one woman wrote, you know what? I don't know, a single woman who first of all would do this and secondly has a body like this. <laughs> Exactly. That's the thing. That's the thing. Uh, it's still a very traditional, as you were saying, the technique is not new, but also the model, they, they speak about, you know, in, um, uh, body uh, positivity, etc. And then they use Bella Hadid, which would look good in any dress or even without clothes or even with a burqa, she would always look hot. You know what I mean? It's no, Bella Hadid. I, I just, I'm not getting her vibe. It's just a girl. No, I'm not talking about vibe. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about, about a proportion. I'm okay. talking about from, okay. from from I may I, I do like her very much, but you may not like her, but you will agree that she is from the yeah, point yeah, of view she, no, she's, of she's proportion, she's beautiful. But uh, like Naomi Campbell, like you can't nobody can say that she's not beautiful, even though you as an individual you may not like her, but she is perfection. You know, I don't know. I, I think Nana Campbell is probably closer to perfection than Bell. Oh, Jackson. yeah, no, no. On that, I agree. Even as on the catwalk, she's a much better. What I mean is, regardless of our individual taste, they are canonically beautiful. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But uh, I'm a bit skeptical about you. Anyway, anyway, regardless of that, I enjoyed the hate section comments. That was good. Good, good. good. Also, because what you're saying makes me, uh, to some extent, the complaints were the same thing that I was saying. So people are complaining about the fact, not about the performance itself, but about the fact that it conveys the message that the performance is more important than clothes. Yeah. Uh, so the, the removing the attention from the clothes and people really watch the shows, not only for the show, unless you are there and you can enjoy the moment, but for actually the clothes that are going to be, you know, uh, worn next season. And you're right, Coperni is not anywhere close to my bank account. The, yeah, the only thing is that nobody knew Coperni until last season, and now everybody's talking about Coperni on the internet. Because we also superseded, uh, we, we, we removed the idea of 
liking something with the concept of interaction on social media it doesn't matter how many likes you have what matters is how many interactions you have and interactions are likes as well as dislikes as well as bad comments yeah. so in this world Copernic gained something we lost but they gained indeed so i was watching a lot of political videos and news over the last month I think our global uh, situation, you know, both uh, locally in the UK, but also globally, is getting quite horrific. Yes. Uh, obviously, you know, I watched Putin's annexation speech last week, and uh, I have to highlight some of my favorite bits, if I may. Oh, yeah, please. So he said what vast is practicing Satanism and he is bringing satanic values towards Russia. And, but you know what? I, I'm, I'm genuinely trying to understand what is the problem? Like, what is the Putin's intention? Because I think both Russia and Ukraine are in deep shit especially Russia. Like Ukraine probably more physically, Russia is more sort of, you know, on a reputation state. And I was really trying to understand what's motivating this person. Is it is it the idea of superiority of uh, Soviet idea of unity? Or is it what yeah. he is saying? Like his narrative was with America with its satanistic values mm -hmm. is trying to enslave Russia to turn it into a second South Korea. And I was like, it's not a bad perspective. <laughs> you know, South Korea has got a growing economy, right? Like with country South Korea, but he's trying to turn it into North Korea. Yes, exactly. And but, but North is... Korea, they are starving. Yes, exactly. No, but Putin is talking about South Korea. Oh, okay. He, no, but that's his point. He he is saying that everyone who is friendly with the United States is going to be enslaved. And Russia is not a country to be enslaved. He said that they promote yeah. democratic uh, and liberal values, which is just So I'm not I'm not a political expert, but I did read Minister. some comments as well. And two things struck me. The first is that the religion occupies in Russia a, I don't know if you realize that as a, as a, somebody who was born in Russia, but religion occupies a, an importance that I don't see anywhere else. And I come from the country that is commonly considered the most religious country in Western Europe, Italy, uh, very Catholic. But in Italy, Catholicism does not have the same importance in the public sphere, whereas uh, the the place of the of the Kirill uh, and all the Russian Orthodox Church, they they are really relevant in Russia and. And in Italy, nobody would care about those the religious things. And this is the first thing. Second thing, I read some opinions on what on exactly the touch on what you're touching, and apparently. Several commentators agree on one fact. Putin never promised wealth to Russians. What he promised was greatness of the Russian nation. And apparently for, for most Russian in the polls, the, mo the worst moment in history for them is when Russia was defeated by Japan in, I think, in 1905. Mm -hmm. yeah, was yeah. it 1905? Yeah, that's, so. the, that's the moment that Russians still remember as the biggest moment of defeat. Mm -hmm. So because Russians have never been defeated except that one time, you know, they were the only country who was, that was able to but, defeat but was Napoleon. was very embarrassing. And, War. Yeah, that was very embarrassing. So the problem is that he wanted to make Russia great again. <laughs> <laughs> to quote, I mean, we know <laughs> to quote his friend. <laughs> we know someone who and did the, it recently. <laughs> exactly. And the problem is that they underestimated the the other Russia, Ukraine. You know, the three Russias, Belarus, Ukraine, and <laughs> and and now he cannot. He's got pressures from a part of her of his own government uh, to you know to to be stronger and stronger because he's getting defeated and this is something he thought was an easy win is turning out to be and this is something that he will not be forgiven for you can even make people poor but don't remove the glory from them 
Yeah, I mean, I wonder what the Russian church is going to do now all the young men are being mobilized and drafted. And they will go to heaven, did you see? Kirill said that all the people who die in, in, in the battlefield will go to heaven. Well, like I, I think he'd rather, have, he'd rather have them in their bedrooms, but all on that's, all but... That's not too different from, you know, from uh, extremist Muslims that say that, you know, if you if you kill yourself, by killing people yeah. who are not, you know, know. they go to uh, heaven. <laughs> Putin also said what West is trying to turn all of us into transgenders. And he said our country has strong family values. I thought it was very hilarious hearing it from a person who is divorced. Yeah, exactly. Seems to exactly. have mistresses and generally has a very ambiguous... Very, he yeah. doesn't admit having any children. Like, He's got a daughter. But officially like they deny it like officially yes like if you read daily mail putin has got many children but uh officially nothing is <laughs> do you remember when uh, russia was one of the first countries to issue to create a vaccine for covid and and putin sputnik, uh, sputnik and and Putin vaccinated his daughter first. The first person he rushed to be vaccinated was his daughter. Now I understand why, because he wanted to kill her. You know. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> he was proven the greatness, the greatness of Russia. <laughs> I don't know, JP, yeah, like, that's it. The, the country is not looking for wealth and prosperity. You you got it right. There is some idea of greatness, and this greatness will be like, you know, let the whole world die, let yeah. all of us die, but, but we will glory. be great in yeah. heaven yeah. and yeah. glory. Yeah. And this is just bizarre and you know i think putin putin needs to get some sort of an action he probably needs to meet a new prime minister i think we georgia have... georgia no she hates him really she did love him in the past but since the war she has straight away stunted against putin and for ukraine because think about it she is a nationalist and she cannot really forgive a guy who invades another nation she that's said a, not gender identity just like you yeah know. she did say so but i think sh she's not as as extreme as the british media want to tell you mm -hmm. because she didn't say not to gender identity. She, she didn't say that she said you can do whatever you want in your privacy just don't teach it to children that's what she said she was not you know, anyway mm -hmm. i don't want to defend georgia meloni because uh, <laughs> i really don't want to but what i'm saying is what i'm saying is what i'm saying is miles away she stands against putin uh, and she has been very clear. She is for uh, for sanctions, and she is actually she supports Poland rather than Russia in right now. And Polish also the Polish is the Polish right is against Putin, so she's not. Uh, she shame. used to be a Putin fan in the past, but now since the aggression, she has stunted against Putin straight away. I think Putin needs to find his Melania. I think that could maybe take some tension probably, away. Probably he should find Melania, you know. <laughs> maybe now she's available. Now that she's available. She actually supported pretty well the previous candidate who was exactly. making things great again. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. She loves um, things great again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dressed in Dolce and Gabbana. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I saw the show as well. Nothing changes. Like Dolce Gabbana is the steadiest brand ever. Like yeah, exactly. Season yeah. in, season out. <laughs> I, I I saw there was lots of media posting about uh, Dolce Gabbana being racist or something. Like, oh, have they done some some scandal again? I, again, I, I, I they're know, always I, doing scandals. I mean, I don't know. They you know they Dolce, love scandals yeah Dolce Gabbana is just a brand where you get your black lace dress and, yeah exactly it's, it's, and it is what it is. even though the last the last collection was pretty different from the previous ones yeah and uh, I'm amazed at how they first of all they're independent and they're not part of a group or anything I mean no one's going to support them <laughs> and they always manage to survive you know, they are the ultimate demonstration that scandals don't really affect sales that much because you scandalize a minority of Western, uh, you know, uh, open-minded mm, people. Uh, but there is entire countries that don't care about those things and they still buy them. To be honest, so when I was in Italy, I saw lots of quite young men wearing DNG belts. Like, right, yeah. I, I haven't seen it anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Like, here everyone is wearing, I don't know, Hermes belt, like, is it what you wear here? But in Italy, everyone wearing DNG belts. Uh, some like, of them must be fake as well. <laughs> possibly. Well, 
you know what we watched house of gucci and what we said like you exactly. know it doesn't matter if it's real or it's fake exactly but, but you know the trust in your brand that's what matters, that's what matters. yes Oh yeah, so just be like just to say like the general comment, I was really thinking, you know, the whole nuclear war is bullshit. But no, the think- reality is, like you're saying, because Putin cares about the message, not about the situation, yeah. uh like he will do anything and now Ukraine is liberating Lugansk, um uh, Kherson, Z- the Parogia, this is where my mom was actually born. Uh, now we're reclaiming all this territory. It is, uh, obviously, he is uh, anxious and desperate. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Third World War starts um, any time. And what can I say? Yeah, so... I don't know. Do you have any... I mean, then I tried to be an optimist. I think but... we are not uh, that far from Third World War. <laughs> I'm not I'm not inventing this. I heard many commentators saying that the situation is escalating in a way that is uh, uncannily similar to Second World War. So we are in that moment in which things are precipitating. We have no way of fixing them. Mm-hmm. And we will find ourselves in a very bad situation without having seen it coming. Uh, that's what some commentators have said, and I truly, dearly hope they are wrong. Yeah, but you know, it's also, by example, it's very tempting. So, you know, if Russia and Ukraine start having this nuclear conflict, America will have a say, but when Taiwan and China will yeah. start, uh, you know, having this conflict, yeah. uh, when you have South Korea, North Korea, and Pakistan, India, Israel, Palestine, um, you know, everyone is waiting for a neighbor yeah. to make a first step. Because, yeah. you, yeah. uh, you know, when, you know, when someone is doing something and no one really stops them, you say, you know what, I'm, I'm also going to yeah, you know, fall over here. I fear China a lot because if this situation uh, really goes bad, my, my feeling is that China would be the first one to join Russia. Not so much because they care about Russia, but just because they want to defend the United States so that they can attack Taiwan. And, and 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 by the way, this is one of the reasons why Giorgia Meloni, the new Italian possible possible prime minister, we're not sure yet, um, even though she won the elections, uh, says she, sure? she's against Russia because she doesn't want the Europe to be under the spell of China tomorrow. Mm. So that's what she says. Uh, I'm not sure because in Italy you can win the elections, but then is the pre- uh, I- the Italian Republic is 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 very similar to the British monarchy. Mm. You have the same forces, you know, one cha- two chambers, the cha- like the Senate, which is like the Chamber of Lords, mm-hmm. and then the other chamber, mm-hmm. and then you've got the president, which acts like the British Queen. So he needs to uh, give you a mandate to uh, rule. Um, when you win the elections is not automatic the president can decide to nom- to to entrust somebody else with premiership if they want uh in theory obviously they don't do it but in theory they could okay because you're not a, pres- a prime minister until the president nominates you a prime minister gives you a mandate it's like in britain Liz Truss had to go to scotland to be to be given the mandate by the queen it's for mm-hmm. a formal thing so we don't know yet. Mm, interesting. And you think there are chances we might not? Mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. I thought before the elections, I thought that she may not become prime minister because she is with Salvini and Berlusconi, these other two ho- awful men who um, I thought they would, they hate her. They, they are, they are mm-hmm. in the same group, uh, but the, each of them wants to be the president. So they don't like the idea of sh- her becoming president. So I thought they would make anything they can to avoid her becoming prime minister. The problem is that she got so many votes that she outnumbers them too much and they cannot say a word because she got, she alone got more than the sum of the other two combined together. So they can't really say anything. So at this point, I don't think she there is any possibility for anyone else becoming prime minister. But you know what? At the end of the day, 
Uh, everyone has something to say about Russia, Ukraine, America, China. But I don't believe that any country is sitting and thinking, oh, how can we get rid of China or how we can get rid of Russia? Everyone is too busy with their own problems, internal conflicts, yeah. power relationships. And everyone would rather have a good trading relationship mm. and take advantage of each other. And But our society is not like that. We want to demonstrate power. We happen to get people at the top who have some mental ideas about how to make things great again. And it's just a bizarre tragedy, like absurd in which we live. Uh, that's what I think. It's pretty bad. Yeah, as as uh, Mao would have said, unfortunately, we live in interesting times. Yeah, indeed. Uh, well, time shall tell how the culture gets worse or better, and we will shall uh, keep everyone updated. Until next time. Until if there is the next time.